My idea in all the talks is always to make some demos, some live demos. I was praying yesterday to the demo god that the internet doesn't seem to be as good as uh, I would like. I have kept anyway many local things, so it should be fine. And uh, yeah, that's my ego slide. I'm an <clears throat> IT consultor and part of the Google Developer Expert program. This here is my Twitter ID, so you can follow me there. I will post all the content of the talk, slides, source code, and you can at any time write me. I'm at the moment living in uh, Munich, in Monaco di Baviera, which is the northest uh, Italian city in the world. <laughs> and this is the agenda for today. I will give some introduction. I have chosen three major topics to talk about secure development. One is file storage. How can we store safely our our information in a device, tokens, uh, files that are relevant with personal information. How can we secure the network communications? I will also show you a um, few demos on how can we intercept data and be able to see it, how this can be prevented. And a big part on reverse engineering and obfuscation. So we also examples of making some code injection into APKs live and uh, doing it maliciously so you can get an idea on how an, an APK can be modified to implement some behavior that is not uh, desired by the developers. So first, external storage versus uh, internal storage. Traditionally, when we are working with Android, we need to store information on the device, right? It can be personal information, security tokens with, to communicate with the server, passwords, etc. I like this analogy to talk about uh, external storage and internal storage. When we are storing things externally. That means traditionally on an, on an SD card. Not all the devices have an SD card, right? But um, most of them have. Um, calling this function, get an external storage directory, is like parking a car on the street. All the apps can access your files. There is no limitation. Files may not be removed or uninstalled. And the SD card can be removed, stolen, and we can access the information that is inside. As an example, if you um, add into um, <clears throat> forensics, now WhatsApp is uh, recently they announced, right, that they are encrypting all the information, but before they were not encrypting all the information, and they used to save the conversations on the SD card without encryption. So anybody could remotely access those conversations, send them per email, and encrypt them. Um, voila, you have access to the, to the entire set of conversations of a device. On the other hand, get files there. It's like a parking on your own garage. You are the only one that have access. Uh, no other apps are generally able to, to get into this control environment. Generally means in most of the cases, but uh, there is, of course, a case. Somebody knows here when we can access the internal storage in a device? Somebody? When? No? Okay, when the device is root, we pretty much can access this internal storage, or if we are using the emulator. This can be used if you want to test your own application. You can just install on, a, on an emulator and see access exactly and see what a, an attacker could see on the, on the application you have programmed. Reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is defined as uh, obtaining source code from a compiled binary. When we are working with our Android application, we work with our SDK, traditionally or typically Android Studio. Some people uh, say they use Eclipse. We compile into an APK, and this is the process of going back to the, to the source code. Why Java? Well, Java is partially compiled and then uh, interpreted. Uh, the f number of opcodes and uh, uh, Java Virtual Machine uh, uh, codes are fixed. That means they cannot be extended. And it's just a, a few, um, a very limited number of instructions. Uh, there is no real protection against Java, not only Android, but also the Java applications. In one of the demos, I will show you with uh, Dex to Jar how can we very easily and compile a Java file and, and open it. And why Android? Well, that's the Droidcom, probably that's the first reason. At the top of that, because it's very easy to, to decompile Android. We uh, can download APKs very easily from any source on the internet. Obfuscation is not always happening by default. That means we need to make active our 
Proware file or our Dexware, if we're using uh, another platform, we need to specify which folders we want to encrypt, take some files out, etc. And the translation from APK into a JAR file is extremely easy. There are some legal issues. We are going to talk today about secure development, and of course, we cannot uh, do many things live because uh, we could get into legal problems. But there are a, a few points we can always explain at the beginning. Um, things that are, we cannot do. We cannot decompile an application, recompile it, and then pass it off as if it would be our own application. For example, it's very common that people download games. They uh, recompile them, uh, upload them for free into a pirate website with some advertisements. You can easily inject advertisements into any applications, and then it's profit for them. That's obviously legal, which is the next point. You cannot try to sell it as if it would be your own application. If the license agreement, this thing that we always click yes, but we never read, says that you cannot decompile the application, we cannot decompile this application because we have agreed on a, on a, on a, on a license. And we cannot decompile to remove a protection mechanism if our purpose is economical. If we try to skip a serial number, for example, that's illegal. But uh, we can uh, decompile an application to understand the interoperability. That means to see how we are interfacing uh, to create a program that can interface with the application. Eventually, even to learn, we can uncompile big applications of big manufacturers to see how they are working and which libraries they use, etc. But we cannot do that if we want to make a profit of that. There are different purposes always. Uh, we have here the bad ones, the traditionally bad purposes. It could be in very traditional in video games when you see that uh, in uh, uh, Candy Crush that there is an unrealistic score or in any other game that traditionally has been done by cheating or a, by a very uh, uh, addicted person, generally by cheating. It's very easy to see how the score is, uh, is being stored. Traditionally, it's being stored locally. Uh, it, this can be manipulated. We can see the HTTP calls that are being sent. We can see the token. And we can just submit our own score. There is not many, generally nobody, or a few applications are applying um, real mechanisms of protections. We can also see privacy leaks. This uh, is uh, very, every three or four months is done with WhatsApp. There is a, a new study showing how can we uh, manipulate the, the conversations, how can we substitute another person, how can we steal personal data, etc. And as malware, it's very, very easy to inject code. There was even the case of an Irish guy that took, uh, do you know uh, Swift keyboard? How many people know Swift keyboard? OK. so. There was an Irish guy that took Swift keyboard, and as a proof of example, he inserted a keylogger and sent all the information that the people that was downloading this uh, illegal Swift keyboard was typing. He substituted everything with the stars, every 10 characters, So, because obviously there was like passwords and credit card numbers and et cetera, but he proved how this can be done in, in pretty much a day. And um, there are, of course, good reasons to use reverse engineering educational. We can use it to learn how others are, program, are programming. We can also research bugs, even of our, on our own applications. And we can interface. Some applications are closed, so we can see, OK, how can are, are you sending things to your server? Um, which uh, calls are you using? I would like to interface with your application. How to obtain them? Um, I have put here uh, four examples. There are probably more. You can pull it from the device. If the device is root, you just can connect the device to the ADB, ADB pool, and the APK name, and then you have it on your laptop. You can use the Google Play Python API. It's an, it's an API that you can download and pretty much authenticate, send your request, download the APK. Alternative sources, if you go to Google and type something like download APK, you will have 100 websites. And with a sniffer, if you use Wireshark, you just can put your Wireshark between your device and the Wi-Fi network and capture the, the APK when it's being downloaded. Of course, we can protect ourselves against reverse engineering. There are a few suggestions or solutions you can think of. For example, you could write two versions of the same app, one that is free and contains a part of the application, and the other one that is full and contains the entire logic. Obfuscation, 
Um, I like to grow uh, this here because um, obfuscation at the end it's, um, it's a partial solution. We know that obfuscation is something that is not uh, the goal key to prevent obfuscation, uh, to prevent reverse engineering, but it uh, stops and it slows down a lot uh, prospective attacker. We take the code, we totally change it and interlace it, we create fake functions so it's very difficult to read. We can use web services, which is in general a good practice. An application should be light and should handle not a lot of logic. Everything should be sent from the web service. But we can try to store as much information as possible on the, on the cloud. Not to protect from reverse engineering, but to be able to identify that and to prove it uh, in, if there is any legal issue. We can use fingerprinting in our code using some kind of uh, mechanism to demonstrate that the code has been written by ourselves. And we can use ND key or native methods to store information, such as tokens to communicate. ND keys is not decompilable directly, so the code is much more safer there. Now let's gonna start with a, with a few demos. I hope the, the internet is, uh, is a little bit better now. Let me make a next a check. Well, one of the first uh, demos I wanted to make was with uh, the emulator, so in a program, a uh, very small program I wrote called SnapHack. This SnapHack application can take um, pictures, encrypted and not encrypting. For that, I'm, I'm using a, a framework from Facebook called Conceal. Yeah. This one from here. It's great if you, are, uh, if you want to encrypt any, any type of information. It can be images, it can be um, strings, uh, it can be absolutely everything, text files, whatever. And uh, as an example, I can take here uh, with this program a photo. This photo will be a, a normal one, not encrypted. If it's working. Well, because I know those things can happen, I already took some pictures that I can show you, but let's try to open it again. Okay. Well, now that we are here, I might show you also the, the login. This is a web service I wrote very easily to make the, the login. So now we have login. And um, that's very cool, because I can actually, yeah, I can show you here how it works when we are calling to a, a, web, service that, a web service that is not encrypted. So this is Charles. Do you know how many people here knows Charles? Okay. For those who don't, it's an excellent tool for uh, network debugging. You can connect your device to Charles. It's acting as a bridge with a Wi-Fi connection, and you can capture all the information that has been sent. For example, if I came here, I can see that the, all the, the network's requests I'm sending. So I can see the, the code I'm, I'm getting back, I can see the, uh, the response I'm getting from the server. In this case, I'm getting, this is just a very, a very standard web service I wrote. It's always returning a code, a message, and a key. But many, um, I've seen in many companies while consulting that they are not using HTTPS, because they have, you know, you need to get a certificate, and that's expensive. This is what you're facing. You could very easily connect this with, uh, with Wireshark, uh, poison the network, and being able to access tokens, passwords, if they are not encrypted, et cetera. Um, so back to Johnny Motion. I'm gonna take here one. Okay. Still not working, but as I told you, I took the pictures before. If I can here to the file manager, I have here the folder SnapHack. And you can see that one of the pictures is, uh, has been taken. This one has been encrypted. So when I type here, I cannot see it. With, uh, with this framework Conceal, I can unencrypt the, encrypt the picture and only be able to, to read it from the application. Okay, that has been the first demo. I'm gonna make uh, one now, a little bit more complex, with, um, uh, with a Hello World application. Um, I will make some code inje injection. I will show you how the application can be decompiled and how the code can be injected. So here I have a Hello World file that I will install. Okay. Let me uninstall what I have here. Okay. 
OK. This is a very simple file, right? I have a hello world with a text view that says hello world Android. What I'm going to do it is uncompile and make code injection inside. What do I use to uncompile? So there is a, the application I'm going to use is called APK tool. You just can Google and download the last version. Basically, this uh, APK converts from the, AP, the APK file that has been already compiled into Smiley. Here we need to type um, the name of the, of the file we want to uncompile. Uh, and we need to write also the parameter D, that means uh, decompile. Good. So now if I came here, for example, in Hello World, this is the, the result of the, uh, what I have done. If I came, there is an smiley folder. We can see here that uh, there are some smiley files. Um, we also can see the R, the resource file. We can see all the inner classes. This is the attribute, draggable. This is a very basic example, but as we can imagine, if we uncompile Facebook, for example, there would be many classes. Let's go now open Hello World activity to see how it looks like. Okay. Sometimes opening things with Xcode can be a little bit scary because it opens the entire environment, but no, this time was great. So if we read the file and we've been programming with Android, some things make sense, right? We can see that we have a constructor. We can see that uh, uh, this is the source file. This thing from here looks like uh, this is the super class, right? The super class is, uh, so this class, hello world activity extends from activity. We have a, a virtual method. So the virtual methods are the, the ones that we are defining, like on create, right? If you have been programming with assembler, this will uh, look similar to you. Because we have a, we put in, in some registers the variables, then we can add some values. So if we read here, we see that we have a text view. The text view has a, a string. Looks is very interesting that the string is not encrypted unless we use another message, but we can access here the, the resource directly. We can make something like hello world iOS. And uh, yeah, I'm, I actually want to make um, an example of code injection. It's a little bit more complex, so I wrote it here in another file. And uh, what is code injection? Code injection is when we take functionality that we have written in another application and show it. In this case, I'm going to make something very easy and very simple, which is taking a toast, putting the toast into the application, and recompiling. But we can imagine that this has many different possibilities. We could insert ads with our own ad ID. We could uh, insert a keylogger that is uh, uh, logging everything we're typing. We could insert some module that takes the personal information, credit cards, et cetera, on the background and sends also as well to a different web service. So that's one lesson from today as well. Do not download applications from obscure resources because you see how many things we can do. So now that this file has been saved, I will come here again. And again, with the APK tool, I will recompile the application. I need to use the parameter B and now the, the folder where this has been stored. And now we see that if everything worked, we have now in the folder dist a new APK. So now I'm, I'm going to install this new APK. Or do I need to do something? Can you think of something that I still need to do to make the application work? Right. Yeah. If I don't see it, it will not, uh, not work. So let me remove this application. So also because signing is such a long uh, line, I already put it here. Um, yeah. So with your signer, I will uh, use a key store I have created there. Password 126. Jar has been signed. So now I will install the Hello world. And have you seen the toast and Ajo. So starting with an application, I have made some code injection. And the application is working now with the same certificates, et cetera. OK, that's the first demo of uh, reverse engineering now. Let's going to show some demo on, um, with a CrackMe. A CrackMe is, uh, is basically an application that uh, 
Uh, it's used for in a cracking uh, context. So people design a crack meme. The crack meme is designed, as you can imagine, to be cracked. Uh, and uh, well, people try to, there are always like a lot of contests with crazy people using crazy obfuscation and crazy systems to, to store the information. This is a very easy one, because obviously we don't have a lot of time, just so you get the context, the, a little bit the, uh, the concept of how crack meme works. I'm going to use a similar technique. So here we have, a, we have to enter a name. Uh, we have to enter a serial number. If the serial number is not working, we get a toast that says bad boy. If the serial number is working, the application will allow us to, to use it for free, even if it's a crack map. And um, uh, now let's, uh, let's going to use a different tool. This time I will use a tool called Text2Jar, which should be here. So dex 2 jar basically takes, uh, takes uh, uh, an APK file and converts it into a, into a jar file. Jar files are very easy to decompile. We will go a little bit more into that. But uh, yeah, basically I will call this uh, thing from here. Let me see what I have the crack me. Okay. So the command I'm calling is uh, from dex 2 jar please transform this APK into a jar file. Now I have this jar file here, and I will open it with a GD uh, guy. GD is a Java decompiler. It can be used for Java files, and as well from Android files when they have been transformed into Java. And uh, when it has been transformed, now we can see the code in Java, and it's not a translation, so the X2Jar doesn't make it a perfect translation, but we can see that we can understand some things here, right? So there is a telephony manager, that takes uh, some fields uh, from, the, from the device. It takes a substring, that uh, another number that gets the device ID, the SIM serial number. Uh, then we make some comprobation, like uh, if this is string plus uh, this symbol from here, let me zoom in, plus another string and another symbol, if that's good, then so something that says good boy. As I said, it's not a perfect translation, so when we are using dex 2 jar we need to put it into our Android Studio compiler. We need to look, go line by line. There are things that doesn't make sense, like this return here, or this, um, um, there are a few things like a continue. We don't need a continue here, et cetera, or an int uh, at the end that nobody's going to read, but we can understand a little bit what it does. I took that, uh, I made that job already for you. And I put this into a, into a file that is compiling. Yeah. Exactly, this one from here. And uh, in this one, I, I also type um, this stream from here is the one that we are typing on the stream. So if we open this with Android Studio and we execute, we will go on the while through, etc. And at some point, we will, we will reach a number similar to this one. So if now I can hear to the emulator and type this thing from here, I will say good boy. So it's by the way good, not good. But uh, yeah, you see the, you get the, the main point, right? Um, it's, uh, if, if we are not using obfuscation, it's very, very easy to, to decrypt those applications. I have a, a couple of commercial examples. Uh, one of them is uh, SwiftKey, a very old version. Now SwiftKey is using um, ProGuard. But we can see this is uh, SwiftKey being uh, uncompiled. We can see we came into the, uh, its own packets, and we can hear into touch type that pretty much we can read all the classes. There is uh, nothing very, very hidden here. We can see in the constants that we can see all the numbers, how they're Start if we, that's very interesting because we can look actually for HTTP calls. If we can here and go to search and try to search for a HTTP pattern in a string constant, then yeah. So all those things are things that are matching. Uh, yeah. And yeah, pretty much we can see uh, that there are many constants. We could, we could see when tokens are being stored. We could modify the tokens. We could try to call directly the web services and see which effect is having, etc. And uh, yeah, the way to, there are 
two main ways to, uh, or a, a few ways I explained before to get protected from this. One is to use ProGuard, but as we have seen, ProGuard has this big problem that is not uh, encrypting strings. If we want to uh, encrypt or obfuscate strings, I can think of two main ways. One is using DexWare. It's a commercial solution, but it uh, applies obfuscation on strings, so when we are decrypting the application, it's not being shown. And another one is using NDKey. How many people here has experience with NDKey? How many of them have used it for security purposes? Okay. Yeah, normally nobody puts the hand up, so that's a, already a good number. With NDKey, we compile files into object files that can still be decrypted. So uh, we can call the O file with the name of the function, and the function will return us, uh, will, will actually return us what is returning, but we can make a use of. Um, Entropy, that means if we want to generate a token that is going to communicate with a server, we could take values of the phone that are never the same and cannot be reproduced. For example, the local time or the amount of RAM being used, etc. we can create a hash with all this information being sent to the server and the server will speak the same language. So they can understand that they are communicating between each other and this is critical for applications like banking or PayPal or things that are involving money because we get rid of all the possible attackers that put Wireshark in the, in the middle and make a money in the middle attack and take all our data. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I think that's been uh, everything. I will upload all the code on my, on my Twitter. And I love feedback on, on talks so I can see what things can improve, what audience like and not. If uh, I have prepared this small formula here, if you leave me your feedback, um, I have created this bit ly address, feedback droidcon it16. I will give to one of the persons that leave feedback um, a book I wrote with 100 questions and answers to help you land your dream Android job, which I think is a very good book. And uh, yeah, anything you need, feel free to grab me at any time. I will also be at the app clinic most of the, most of the day, so you can gain there if you have any question or you want to talk. Thanks for being here, and if you have any question or something you want to talk about, something that was not clear, just raise your hand and I will be happy to answer. This one? Stop. No questions? Okay, then, came later if, uh, to the app clinic. Let's gonna have a talk, and uh, thanks everybody for being here. Think wonderful. <laughs>